good day and welcome to the IMAX Corporation Second Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, all lines are in, on mute. There will be a Q&A session after prepared comments. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Mr. Brett Harris, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on today's second quarter earnings conference call. On the call today to review the financial results are Rich Gelfond, Chief Executive Officer, and Joe Sparacio, our Interim Chief Financial Officer. Megan Colligan, President, IMAX Entertainment, and Rob Lister, Chief Legal Officer, are also joining us today. Today's conference call is being webcast in its entirety on our website. A replay of the webcast will be made available shortly after the call. In addition, the full text of our second quarter earnings press release and the slide presentation have been posted on the Investor Relations section of our website. At the conclusion of this call, our historical Excel model will be posted to the website as well. I'd like to remind you of the following information regarding forward-looking statements. Today's call, as well as the accompanying slide deck, may include statements that are forward-looking in that they pertain to future results or outcomes. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that could cause our actual future results to occur um, or occurrences to differ. Please refer to our SEC filings for a more detailed discussion of some of the factors that could affect our future results and outcomes. Any forward-looking statements that we make on this call are based on assumptions as of today, and we undertake no obligation to update these statements as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. During today's call, references may be made to certain non-GAAP financial measures. Discussion of management's use of these measures and the definition of these measures, as well as the reconciliation to non-GAAP financial measures including adjusted net loss, adjusted EPS, and adjusted EBITDA as defined by our credit facility are contained in this morning's press release and our earnings materials, which are available on, on the Investor Relations page of our website at IMAX.com. With that, let me now turn the call over to Mr. Richard Gelfond. Rich? Um, thanks, Brad, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. With theaters reopening, <clears throat> audiences returning, and the pipeline of Hollywood blockbusters steadily growing from a trickle to a flood, the global box office continues to show encouraging signs of improvement. Indeed, we believe IMAX is leading the global recovery of the film industry. Uniquely positioned to benefit immediately from the upcoming acceleration of Hollywood blockbuster releases and poised to take market share as the world reopens. <clears throat> Our results for the second quarter clearly demonstrate this. The company delivered its best gross margins and adjusted EPS of the pandemic era, despite a Hollywood slate only slightly better than prior quarters, demonstrating again the high margin nature of our asset light licensing business. We delivered our third consecutive quarter of positive EBITDA. Our global network earned $109 million in box office, surpassing initial projections thanks to better than expected domestic performance for our second consecutive $100 million plus box office quarter. We've already eclipsed our total 2020 box office for local language films. And we easily drove year over year quarterly growth in revenue, gross margins, and EBITDA, demonstrating how far we've come since the second quarter of 2020, the first quarter we felt the full brunt of the pandemic. We are con confident these positive trends will not only continue, but accelerate with a full slate of exclusive theatrical releases later this year. We've wielded our unique advantages to effectively manage through COVID. We built the only global out-of-home platform for blockbuster entertainment with a diversified footprint across 85 countries and territories worldwide. We have a flexible asset light business model, and we are an in-demand global brand, beloved by audiences worldwide, critical to filmmakers and studios, and ripe for new business opportunities, including our IMAX Enhanced Home ent Entertainment Initiative. Even in a world of shifting windows and evolving distribution models, an IMAX release is a window unto itself. 
proven to draw moviegoers to the theaters, drive premium revenue, and launch event films into the ecosystem. Now with COVID finally receding in many key markets, we're beginning to see the industry stabilize and establish stronger forward momentum than at any other time during the pandemic. As a result, we see an opportunity for IMAX to further expand and diversify our global network, grow and diversify our content portfolio, and lean into the increased blockbusterization of the movie business. Today, I'd like to provide a strategic update on the reopening and future of our global network, signs of strong audience demand for the IMAX experience, why IMAX is well positioned as windows and distribution models evolve, and finally, our fast accelerating content pipeline. But first, let's look at the current state of our network. The IMAX global network is now 90% open, higher than at any time in the pandemic era. The domestic network is about 95% open and operating at about 90% capacity. And internationally, excluding China, our theaters are about 80% open and at around 67% capacity. In China, our theaters are virtually 100% open. We continue to open more theaters and see capacity limitations ease with availability in the, in the domestic and international markets already up over the launch of Black Widow earlier this month. We've installed nearly 100 systems to our network and signed 80 during the pandemic as exhibitors look to IMAX to reinvigorate their businesses with a differentiated premium offering. And we continue to add premier flagship locations around the world, locations that offer significant box office potential and further enhance the prestige of our brand. This month, we opened our first ever theater in Cannes, France, in a brand new state-of-the-art multiplex, digital art gallery, and event space on the Mediterranean. The theater is already drawing interest as a screening location from the many international events hosted in Cannes, most significantly, including the Cannes Film Festival. We're currently installing our biggest IMAX screen in the world in Leonberg, Germany, measuring at 22 meters high and wider than a Boeing 737. We needed a 17,000 seat hockey arena in Ontario to unfurl and paint the screen before shipping it across the Atlantic. And IMAX theaters will be featured in several of the iconic Los Angeles cinemas that have recently transferred ownership, including the Grove and the Americana, which AMC will reopen next month, and Sherman Oaks, um, which has already reopened with Regal. Both AMC and Regal continue to look for opportunities in the marketplace to add IMAX theaters in newly acquired marquee locations. We continue to see considerable room for growth around the world. The IMAX Global Network currently stands at just under 1,600 theaters worldwide with a backlog of 419 theaters. And we see a total addressable market of 3,300 theaters driven by the many international markets around the world where moviegoers are clamoring for our unrivaled experience. Not only are theaters reopening, audience demand is remarkably strong, and we expect it to continue to grow as COVID recedes and more moviegoers regain their comfort level returning to theaters. Perhaps the most encouraging trend of the second quarter is the domestic box office, which continues to demonstrate the same pent-up demand for blockbusters that we've seen in Asia and the Middle East. New tentpole releases continue to pass every big test at the box office. Despite a day-and-day -day release on HBO Max, Godzilla vs. Kong, has delivered more than $100 million at the domestic box office and $460 million globally, including $37 million in IMAX so far. A Quiet Place 2, the first exclusive theatrical blockbuster release of the summer season, vastly exceeded expectations, delivering an opening on par 
with what was expected pre-COVID, despite significant capacity limitations in place at the time. F9 has also performed up to pre-pandemic levels thanks to a bold global rollout designed to maximize the, theatr the, the exclusive theatrical window. And most recently, Black Widow opened to $158 million worldwide, giving IMAX its best opening for a Hollywood film, and it's the best domestic opening weekend box office inde indexing and per screen average average during the pandemic era. As we've said, the recovery of the box office will be a gradual, incremental process, a faucet, not a light switch, but it's clear that we're headed in the right direction. Additionally, many of the studios that have experimented with hybrid release strategies are recommitting to exclusive theatrical releases for blockbusters, coalescing around a 45-day window for most pen polls. This benefits IMAX as it enhances the, the event nature of an exclusive theatrical release and further increases IMAX's role as curator of blockbusters. Given that films generally only play in our network for one or two weeks at most, we are well positioned to take advantage of that compressed demand. Studios and filmmakers are clamoring to secure and make the most of their IMAX window, whether it's shooting with our cameras, including IMAX exclusive expanded aspect ratio, or creating exclusive events, like the preview that Universal screened for Jurassic World Dominion before F9, or the exclusive Dune preview we hosted in select locations last week. All of this helps drive demand and ultimately market share for the IMAX experience. Also, the experimentation we've seen among studios in the past year, along with movie releases from pure play streaming companies, has underscored the irreplaceable role of a theatrical release in launching and growing franchise properties, the kind of IP that is driving the entire ecosystem right now. For all its value, streaming has yet to create a blockbuster film franchise, and all the downstream revenue a franchise film creates. At the end of the day, there is still no event in entertainment that commands the attention of culture like a global theatrical blockbuster release. And IMAX is at the vanguard of these culture-defining moments. So the table is set for a strong rebound at the box office, with one outstanding exception a steady supply of big, bankable blockbuster films. Certainly, the global box office has demonstrated that it is ready for business with the films that have held their release dates during the summer season. But the summer season has still been lighter on blockbuster releases than we'd hoped. The studios take a conservative approach, pushing many tentpole releases into the fall of 21 or 22. Right now, the only real issue holding the box office back from a faster rebound is supply. That is changing, though, as the Hollywood content pipeline is accelerating with strong slate ahead. When Marvel's Shang-Chi releases on September 3rd, that kicks off a cadence of major blockbuster releases roughly every two weeks, including Venom, Bond, Dune, Eternals, Top Gun Maverick, Spider-Man, and The Matrix. The pipeline, as we've said, is remarkable. For instance, in the second quarter, the only global blockbusters we had with exclusive theatrical releases were F9 and A Quiet Place Part 2. Compare that with Q2 of 2022, which is absolutely stacked with franchise films, including the new Thor, Mission Impossible, John Wick, Transformers, Jurassic World, Disney's Lightyear, and Brad Pitt Actioner Bullet Train. Even beyond Hollywood, the IMAX content portfolio emerges from the pandemic stronger and more diversified, given the way we leaned into local language production during COVID and strengthened our brand in key institutional markets. 
As I mentioned, in 2021, we've already surpassed our total 2020 box office for local language film. And we expect to top our record-breaking 2019 local language box office by the end of the third quarter. The critical Chinese market is also demonstrating pent-up demand for Hollywood blockbusters, with F9 proving that when a global blockbuster franchise receives an exclusive theatrical release, the Chinese market will embrace it, as we've seen it do in the past. Some, the table has set a strong rebound for the global film industry. The reopening of theaters is accelerating. Audiences are coming back in big numbers, and the flow of blockbuster content into theaters this fall and beyond is unprecedented. As we demonstrated in the second quarter, as blockbusters return to theaters, our numbers will improve markedly. The IMAX experience has been in strong, growing demand around the world, and we are strengthening our position as one of the world's premier entertainment experiences. We look forward to building on our unique, privileged position in the entertainment ecosystem, driving new opportunities for growth and creating value for our shareholders. Thanks again to all of you for joining us today. Please continue to do everything you can to stay self safe and healthy. With that, I'll turn it over to Joe Sparacio. Thanks, Rich, and good afternoon, everyone. As Rich mentioned, we posted another quarter of significantly improved performance as our network continues to reopen in the U.S. and across the world. Operating results continue to improve, which serves to highlight our superior business model. As a reminder, we are a global asset light licensing business with a low cost base and high incremental margins. This quarter serves as a preview for what is to come as Hollywood films return in earnest to our quickly reopening global network. We ended the quarter with 214 million in cash and 241 million of debt. 115 million of cash was held at IMAX China and 99 million at IMAX Corp. In the quarter, we paid down the balance of our credit facility leaving the full $300 million undrawn, which, when combined with our cash on hand, an undrawn component of our IMAX China Working Capital Facility, gives us approximately $530 million of available liquidity. As I discussed the second quarter, please remember year-over-year -year results reflect the almost complete closure of our network in the second quarter of 2020. Second quarter 2021 revenues increased to 51 million from 9 million in 2020. Adjusted EBITDA increased to, increased to 8.7 million versus an EBITDA loss of 18.5 million in the year ago period. An adjusted EPS loss improved to 12 cents from 44 cents in comparison to the year ago period. IMAX Technology Network revenue increased $19.7 million in the second quarter, from essentially nil in Q2 of 2020. The reopening of the company's network, particularly in Asia and the U.S., drove box office of $109 million versus $3 million in Q2 of 2020. Gross margins for this business were $8.7 million, which increased from a loss of $6.5 million in Q2 2020, largely due to higher box office driven revenue and the operating leverage inherent in the business model. IMEX technology sales and maintenance revenue for the second quarter increased $28.7 million from $4.6 million due to higher sales and FTL revenue as installation of new systems increased and an increase in maintenance revenue commensurate with the reopening of the network. <clears throat> this quarter, we installed 15 new IMAX systems, nine of which were sales or STLs, two of which were hybrids. We installed three IMAX systems in Q2 of last year. Installation activity increased both year over year and sequentially 
demonstrating continued IMAX system demand from our exhibition partners. Gross margins for this business increased to 16.1 million, representing a 56.1% margin commensurate with the higher revenue levels. SG&A, excluding stock-based compensation, declined 4% to 22.4 million in the quarter, as compared to 23.3 million in the comparable period last year. The reduction in SG&A included an increase in costs allocated out of SG&A and into inventory and cost of goods sold of 4 million, partially offset by a 1.5 million decrease in various COVID-19 wage-related programs. In the second quarter, we spent 1.8 million on capital expenditures, including 900,000 invested in equipment for joint revenue sharing theaters. We believe our second quarter results represent another milestone in the company's emergence from the pandemic. Strong box office in the U.S. and parts of Europe demonstrate the same signs of pent-up demand we continue to see in China. Increased revenue is driving profitability improvement, highlighting our superior high-margin asset-like business model. We have a strong balance sheet with substantial liquidity. And finally, we remain excited for the strong slate of IMAX-friendly titles set to be released later this year. With that, I will turn the call over to the operator for Q&A. Thank you. If you'd like to ask a question, please stick by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. And if you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, press star 1 to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. And we will go first to Eric Handler of MKM Partners. Thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, Rich, I wonder maybe you could give uh, a little peek into how your um, installation uh, my installations might look for the back half of this year, or at least maybe for the third quarter. I wonder what kind of visibility you have there, and I've got a follow-up question. Yeah, I mean, Eric, I don't think we're doing it. We made a policy, you know, during the pandemic not to do that. Um, because it's, you know, it's so unpredictable and it's so territory to territory. But, you know, as you, as you saw last year, you know, we were surprisingly um, active in installations, even though the world wasn't open up. And, you know, I think there'll be activity at the second half of the year. And as you know, we're usually back end loaded in these things, but I'm just not going to be specific until we know, you know, where it's safe and what the course of the virus is. Understood. And then um, wondered if you could talk about, you know, you're obviously seeing good um, local language um, turnout for films in China. Um, how are you sort of going to be implementing similar policies in, in, in other countries and where you see some opportunities uh, in the back half of this year? Yeah, I mean, I've been surprised by how robust some of these markets are in IMAX. In um, China this weekend, we released a movie called White Snake, and we did 9% um, of the box office, and it was a fairly successful film in China. So I'm continually surprised, and I think over time, you'll see these local language films keep edging up until they eventually have the same kind of indexing um, that the Hollywood films are. But it is a strategic initiative of ours, and... Um, you know, we're working closely in different markets. Um, Megan, do you want to give some specific examples? Sure. We've, you know, in Japan, we've set um, two records uh, over uh, the pandemic era with uh, uh, two films uh, uh, that have uh, broken records, and uh, we have a five-picture deal with Toho, so we're continuing to work very closely with that company to be not just uh, releasing their films, but also having them shoot their films using the IMAX certified camera program 
So really leaning into the technology and looking to continue to uh, align closely on our production. Also in Korea, we've had some success with local language products. And the great thing, too, when a movie does break out, um, like we saw with uh, Demon Slayer, uh, those films are able then to be exported out of, say, Japan, where it was a record-setting film, and are able to be distributed in the United States, in Europe, in Korea. There's a market for them outside of Japan, and so it's been a very successful program for us. Great. Thank you very much. We'll go to our next question from Alexia Kodani of J.P. Morgan. Uh, thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. I just have two questions, if I may. The first one, Rich, I'm wondering if you have um, some sort of view on how much, you know, the fact that Black Widow opened sort of day and date with PVOD, how much that may have cannibalized your potential revenue or even keep it general and talk about the box office in general. I'm not sure if you have any more insight than we do, but I thought you might. And then, then secondly, I'm just curious, um, wouldn't, wouldn't we, um, going forward in kind of the new world post-COVID, wouldn't, wouldn't IMAX just sort of continue to kind of index better as a percentage of the total box office, given, you know, in this new kind of streaming heavy world, moviegoers are, are clearly leaning into kind of more experimental kind of experience kind of movies. I mean, it's a, a clearly a positive for you. But I'm wondering if you have a sense of how much will we see it in the numbers? Is it is it a notable positive? So on your first question, Alexia, there's really no question in my mind um, that the combination of PVOD and a lot of um, piracy, and people haven't really talked about that much, but clearly there was a lot of piracy that accounted for the cannibalization, um, significantly affected the box office at the end of the day. You know, it's hard to quantify it. But, you know, some statistics I find interesting are that F9, which used the more traditional distribution model, you know, grossed about 700, will gross around $700 million worldwide at the end of its run, and Black Widow will gross around half of that. So, you know, again, are they comparable movies? This, that, the, I thought Black Widow was a great movie. So when I think about it, I have no doubt uh, a lot of money was left on the table, but I can't, you know, perfectly say what it is. Um, in terms of post-COVID, I do think um, that we will continue to index better. And in fact, in countries that have emerged faster than North America, um, we've seen us have a bigger percentage of the box office. I just, you know, referenced China in the 9% a few minutes ago for local language films. Um, we've been having a higher indexing. And, and I think um, what you're also going to see is there's going to be more and more blockbusters because I think the studios are going to take their more lower cost releases and put those direct to streaming. But the kind of movies that IMAX does um, will, you know, concentrate around the theatrical releases. And I think since that's IMAX's sweet spot, I would expect us to continue to have pretty good indexing numbers. Thank you. And we'll move to our next question from Eric Holt of B. Riley Securities. Thank you. Good afternoon. A uh, couple questions. Yeah. I guess. One, I want to try to follow up on um, the first question from Eric. I know you're not giving um, – System install visibility. I'm not trying to, you know, push that or get any numbers in general, but just kind of what what is the mindset from exhibitors in general around the world? Obviously, they had plans to get stuff installed in 20 and 21, going into the pandemic, um, based on their schedules. Those got disrupted, and now we're starting to reopen. Is is kind of everything that was in the backlog kind of shifted out by some period of time? Just as a, as a placeholder, are they kind of saying to you, look, you know, we're ready to go as soon as possible once we have the green light? Kind of what's, what's their mindset in terms of wanting to get those installed that was on the backlog, you know, previously? So I think the mindset's pretty good, Eric, as you know. And, again, I don't remember exactly the numbers in 2020, but we had something like around 70 installs and close to the same number of signings in 2020. And that was when everything was shut down. 
And in fact, what we've done is we've gone back and we've tried to, um, you know, work with the exhibitors and plan out where they're at with the backlog. And, you know, we haven't, we've taken, vir you know, virtually nothing out of the backlog. We reaffirm their desire to be in the IMAX business. And we're in negotiations now about how that rolls out. I would say a lot of the rollout, you know, is going to be in countries that are open and healthy now, so places or healthier, like um, like Asia, and um, you know, in, in in places like Europe and North America, they're committed to it. But I think we have to work with them on see, seeing, you know, what what the right schedule is. But again, as as I said to Eric's question before. I think the cadence will be similar to last year, with it being back and loaded. No, no, one quick follow up on that. Cause I didn't want to say one one quarter. Obviously, it's not a not a trend make, but I know you talked about the cadence, expecting to kind of get back to where it was. I mean, Q2, the you know, the nine kind of sales size of the installs, you know, were were equal to what you did in in 18 and 19 in that in those years, second quarter. So is that kind of I don't want to read too much into one quarter, but is that kind of indication that things are kind of hopefully get back kind of where they were into the install pattern? You know, Eric, I'm going to refer to your statement that you can't draw a trend from one quarter either way. And, I, you know, I would just say, you know, there's so many factors now. Places just opening up, um, you know, people refurbishing, which some of them did even during the pandemic. So I, I wouldn't generalize about it. Okay. And then just final question, um, as – things start getting back to normal, both, you know, within IMAX and in the industry, how should we think about operating expense trends, um, you know, kind of over the coming quarters and, and, and year or so? And, you know, kind of as we get back to hopefully normal uh, situation, what is what is IMAX's kind of operating expense level look like versus where it was pre-COVID? Are there, are there inherent savings still baked in or is it going to get back to where it was? So, Eric, we're trying to track with our expenses uh, the reopening of the network and the introduction of movies. So, um, you know, the biggest issue now, as I said in my prepared remarks, are, you know, there just weren't a lot of movies being released. So as, I, as you see more movies released, you know, you'll start to see some of the expenses ramp up, obviously, because you need, you know, maintenance people out there and you need, uh, you know, you need to track that. On the other hand, uh, we were very SG&A um, uh, focused before this happened. As you know, over the last several years, we've had very little growth in our OPEX. So we're going to be as uh, vigilant as possible during that period of time and, you know, where we don't have to, um, you know, ramp up prematurely. We're going to, again, I used the word cadence before, but we're going to try to time the cadence of our expenditure of our expenditures um, to the cadence of our revenues as we reopen. Helpful. Thank you. And we'll go next to Stephen Frankel of Colliers. Uh, good afternoon, Rich. Uh, first of all, on the, the local titles in China, where are you in infusing more IMAX DNA as their production values? Uh, improved? Uh, you know, I, the um, IMAX certified camera program has been um, incredibly successful, not just domestically, but internationally. I talked about it earlier as we've incorporated it in our uh, Japanese operation and Korean operation. It's also been something we have been employing in our uh, Chinese productions. we had several movies over Chinese New Year, and it's something that we're actively talking to filmmakers and productions uh, for. You know, we really do focus, as as the Chinese calendar allows for, uh, Chinese New Year becomes a very big moment of, uh, of focusing some of the biggest productions, and those films are the ones that we're really aiming for for some of the some of the films we'd like to be involved in for uh, uh, films that shoot with our cameras, and those are the ones that we're targeting. And certainly uh, films that come out, you know, over the summer, those are the kind of the two big seasonal 
uh, pieces of business and we're in conversation all year long. We're very active. We have people on the ground that are having those conversations and, um, and continuing to kind of educate the film community around um, what it means to shoot with our cameras. It is a very specific process and it is, um, and it is uh, uh, something that requires uh, production work and specific work both pre and post production um, that uh, we work very closely with the filmmakers to do to um, give that level of um, effort to the film. So uh, you should expect anywhere from three to five films a year in China to be shot with our cameras. Great, thank you. And then, because uh, I don't want Joe to feel uh, left out, uh, there was a meaningful sequential step up in uh, R&D this quarter. Uh, is that just kind of getting back, getting people re-engaged, staffing up, or is there some new initiative that might be ramping up that this is the beginning of a, a, a new spending pace for R&D? No, I think it's just getting back to some semblance of normalcy. I mean, as you saw from the note on SGNA, um, the amounts allocated to inventory and cost of goods are starting to get back somewhat to normalcy. So that's just an example. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll move to our next question from Mike Nicky of Benchmark Company. Hey, Rich. Joe, Brett, uh, thanks for taking my questions. Glad to the quarter. Welcome back, Joe. <laughs> nice to hear your voice again. Shocked. Um, anyway, uh, curious on uh, the Delta variant. Uh, hard to know if it's having an impact uh, yet or not. Just sort of curious your view if you're seeing any sort of change in attendance trends is, is that seems to infection seems to be picking up momentum. Also wondering if uh, the reissue of masks in LA has caused uh, any attendance headwind and a couple follow-ups. So it's too early to say, um, Mike, in terms of you know whether it's having an impact. I I, I personally you know don't think it's going to because I think you know among the vaccinated people there's not a lot of um, you know reticence to go to theaters and. Um, um, you know, and we've seen no indication of it. And by the way, in, let's go to Asia again, which we like to talk about a lot. You know, the resurgence in box office there um, was all with an unvaccinated population. Like, you know, China had set records for Chinese New Year, but very little vaccination. And what Megan was talking about in Japan, we had the two biggest movies in the history of Japan and the two biggest IMAX movies in Japan with Demon Slayer and Shin Evangelion. So, you know, I, I, I just don't think there's likely to be a high correlation there. Well, obviously, unless it gets, you know, much more out of control than it is now, and, you know, there's no evidence of that. But I really don't think at the present that that's a significant game changer. Okay, good. The, um, the other question, you mentioned sort of that outlier success in, in regions like China and Japan sort of in, in the pandemic era, I guess. Um, we haven't exactly seen that. We haven't seen that uh, in uh, North America. So when you sort of think about the box office recovery here uh, in the U.S., which is obviously an important region for you, how do you sort of balance the factors in terms of what, what's it going to take, you think, to really have that uh, breakout film, or why are we still sort of, you know, working the right direction, but not that sort of outlier performance we saw in Japan and China? Is it sort of still the virus influence? Is it windows? Is it slate? Just sort of serious your, your broad thoughts there. Yes, yes, yes. Pretty simple answer. Mike, is that <laughs> the studios who were releasing movies in Asia, the two biggest of all time in Japan, and, you know, China, the record Chinese box office, by 30%, on um, the content distributors there um, released movies under their traditional models. And, um, you know, there really hasn't been a big global release 
with a theatrical window. I think you're going to start to see that coming in coming months with you know, things like Venom and Shang-Chi, and um, uh, then you'll get into Bond, and you'll get into um, um, Top Gun, and a lot of other things. So, you know, it's the releases in the United States, the studios have been, you know, extremely conservative about moving dates, and then they, you know, they tried, um, I think, partly in response to um, the pandemic, but partly in response to their own uh, mixed agendas to push, you know, day and date. And I think it's pretty clear um, that that hasn't delivered the same kind of box office or return um, as the alternative. And I think when you look ahead and you look at, you know, virtually every studio has a 45-day window for next year. Um, others are experimenting around it a little bit. But I think once you have uh, good content, day and date releases with marketing campaigns, you'll see the same thing. I think um, I think people in North America have the, the you know the same the mental and physical attitudes as they do in the rest of the world. Yeah, last question, just to sort of follow up to your answer there. Um, obviously, you've been in the industry now for as long as I can remember, Rich. Um, just sort of gut instinct here because there's so much noise to sort of unpack, but just sort of your sort of view on this day and day, you know, from Disney when they think about international and piracy and, and the importance of uh, – you know, the theatrical window, uh, when we sort of get into 2022, call it, uh, do you think they'll sort of continue on this path, or do you think there's enough evidence that they'll sort of uh, submit to that 45-day window that we'll talk about the industry today? So I don't know what their window will be, but I know that every studio has sort of seen the same data um, that Disney has seen. Um, obviously related to that studio. And I think, you know, what Disney did was experiment during the pandemic, which is what they said they were going to do. And I remember Bob Chapek saying, it's, I think, one of the investor days, you know, when times are normal, he thinks theatrical is really important and he thinks theatrical exclusivity is important. And I think when he looks at his data and the pandemic is in the rearview mirror, he's going to come to the conclusion everyone else does, which is the way to maximize value is to have a theatrical window. And, you know, in, in a way, Mike, I don't want to get carried away, but it's not that complicated. You used to sell on the same property five times. Um, now you're selling it once and you're bringing forward some revenues, maybe, well, you know, some windows when you're selling it. But I don't think there are proof points yet that that's a better model. And I think there's lots of smart people. And I think they'll come to the same conclusion. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks a lot. And we'll go next to Tim Goss of Barrington Research. Uh, thanks. You know, recognizing that IMAX does have some clear advantages in terms of demographic serve and blockbuster availability, but I'm wondering, Rich, if you have any concerns <clears throat> that the overall theatrical exhibition business would be pressured in a way that would lead to more consolidation that could have repercussions for IMAX, maybe particularly for North America, but perhaps in other markets as well. So, Jim, the fact is that 85% of our box office is concentrated in the top 20% of theaters. Um, you know, it doesn't really affect me very much because, you know, if there's consolidation, um, nobody's going to close the top 20% of theaters. And in fact, you know, during my prepared remarks, I mentioned the Arclight and uh, the fact that, that that some of those theaters were bought by AMC and some of them were bought by Regal actually inured to our benefit because um, the, the location, even though the chain, um, you know, went away, um, the theaters, which were high performers, were great additions to two of our biggest clients in the world, and they were smart enough to put in IMAX theaters. So, you know, I think consolidation among the top end of screens is probably good for us. And I think the elimination screens at the bottom end, you know, pretty much has no effect because nobody puts an IMAX theater in the bottom 
20% screen. Okay, thanks. Great response. Um, another question. I'm wondering about the trend of in the number of films receiving DMR treatment, especially since you have a lot of indigenous product, are you getting more granular in your approach to content around the globe, and does that give you a lot of a lot more flexibility and potential to take advantage of your screens? Yeah, well, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about local language. We were forced to during the pandemic, so I think the avail the, there definitely is more availability than we've had before. So, you know, the same kind of a, a trend exists in big movies. We get a high percentage of our box office from, you know, a, a relatively small number of movies. So I think during those quieter periods, when you have access to more content, whether it's international or, you know, whether it's domestic, it should help our per screen averages and should help our overall performance. Okay, one last thing uh, in terms of the construction issue that have been brought up uh, earlier. Is there any trend in terms of, uh, I know you tended to focus on hybrid uh, projects uh, between somewhere between joint revenue sharing and sales state lease agreements. But are you skewing in one direction or another right now with uh, whatever incremental theaters you are creating? You know, Jim, um, as you know, there weren't a lot of signings in the first half of the year, and that's typical. I mean, we had some, but not a lot. So I, I don't think it's enough to draw a conclusion on a trend. But our team is out there, you know, talking to uh, lots of potential partners over the world, and I don't think there's been a change in approach um, from the partner's point of view. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jim. And at this time, I'd like to turn the call back to Rich for any additional or closing comments. Um, thank you, operator. I mean, all I'd like to say is that, you know, the last three quarters we've had positive EBITDA. It continues to reinforce the fact that we have an asset light model. When it gets turned on, it, you know, for us, a lot of it goes straight to the bottom line. You know, we don't have leases. Um, we don't have – we have almost virtually no net debt. Um, you know, we're in very good shape financially, and you could see how the beginning of the comeback to domestic has translated right to the bottom line. And we think as the world continues to come back, um, that IMAX's financial results will reflect that, and, um, you know, we get more confident as the year goes on in terms of, you know, the pace of the recovery. Um, so thank you very much, operator. And so, ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>